Welcome, welcome, welcome to Above Replacement Radio. I am your host, Chris Gianta. I might be becoming a bad baseball fan who can't enjoy the romantic things because of advanced statistics. 15 years from now, I want to be on the early baseball committee. Over there on the other side of the screen is Daniel Curran. I literally have the fan graphs hoodie. The baseball reference t-shirt is repping some stats, you know what I'm saying? It's not necessarily Hall of Fame. It's not necessarily above average, but we can guarantee you we are better than just the standard replacement level college sophomore. And welcome to Above Replacement Radio. We're talking baseball kind of whenever I'm your host, Chris Gianta, over there on the other side uh, on the other side of the screen is Daniel Curran. How you doing, Daniel? Chris, I'm doing very well today. We are uh, it really doesn't feel like postseason baseball is two weeks away. I don't know if that's just a me thing, if it's maybe a you thing as well. But we are just two weeks away from postseason baseball being underway. And uh, it is super, actually less than two weeks at this point, right? But it is yeah. super exciting. And it's just especially exciting because there is so much we don't know at this point in the year. Uh, so it's going to be a lot of fun to see how this all plays out in the next few weeks. Yeah, there are literally like four teams in the American league where we don't know what their fate, it, what their fate is at all. You know, one of, one of those four teams is going to miss the playoffs, which is crazy to think about. And then, yeah, in the national league, we have a lot of the same situations, except there's a, not really any divisions at play over there. Um, all the divisions in the national league are pretty much sorted out, but that wild card, you know, we've talked about it for a while is, is absolutely crazy, but yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's, it's crazy how much is still very much yet to be determined or yet to be close to be determined at this point in the year. And uh, yeah, it's making for an exciting regular season. That's for sure. Happy to be uh, watching every day. So yeah, we've been talking about these playoff races for a good while because of how intense they've been and how much th- things seem to have changed and then come back to kind of staying the same for a while. And But we haven't really talked about much as to why it's important for certain teams and like what it means for each organization if they do indeed make the playoffs for some teams it's it's kind of a necessity to be in the playoffs right now because it's their window to succeed and for some teams uh they're arriving early they have a young emerging core and if they miss the playoffs it's not the biggest deal in the world because it odds are they're probably going to be there in the mix next year and years after but that's not the case for every team. So we kind of want to break down each of the bubble teams, each of the teams that has a chance of not making the playoffs this year and and teams that that also have a chance of making the playoffs this year uh, and breaking down kind of what it means for them to make or miss the playoffs. So um, I, for, for notes, I started with the Blue Jays. Um, wh- what do you think about, you know, with with the Blue Jays making or missing the playoffs, what do you think about their situation in those, you know, in those hypotheticals? Yeah, so as it currently stands, the Blue Jays, uh, I believe, are in a playoff spot. They have the number uh, two wild card spot in the American League, but they are not far ahead of you know whoever the the last team in the AL West and the third team in the AL West is going to be. Um, they're eighty five and sixty eight right now. I want to make sure I have this this right. Uh, entirely because they're in it right now but not by a long stretch they're yeah they're half a game above the rangers and mariners both uh so you know this can't happen today but you know a, a loss by toronto and a win by both the rangers and mariners which can't happen because they're playing each other today would knock the mariners out of the would knock the blue jays out of the playoffs so um as it stands according to fan graphs they have a 77.3% chance to make the playoffs. Um, and this would really be a big step backwards for the organization if they miss the playoffs. Um, there would be a lot of things that we have to blame. You know, I think the number one would be Alec Manoa and his, uh, you know, his disappointing season uh, from start to finish, essentially. Um, it would be very reminiscent of 2021 when they missed the playoffs by one game, very likely. Um, and it would really be a waste of a team with a lot of talent and also just a a group with a lot of talent in general, because now we're looking, you know, hypothetically, if they miss the playoffs this year, we're looking at, you know, a four year stretch from 2020 to 20 where they didn't win a single playoff game with all the talent that they had. And Matt Chapman is a free agent at the end of the year. Um, 
And I think that's the only major piece they're losing, but you know, the core is going to be aging, you know, they're all going to be a year older. You know, there's questions about the legitimacy of Vlad Guerrero Jr. There's wonders about Bo Bichette's health, especially in the last month or so. Um, so it, I think it would be, I think the Blue Jays might have the most to lose uh, among all of the teams in the AL. Uh, yes, I would, I would definitely agree with that. Uh, because yeah, this is, you know, even talking about this team, uh, years ago when they were not competitive, we kind of figured like this was, this was when they were going to succeed. This is when they would be at their best and we just haven't seen it yet. We, you know, both of us, yeah, I think both of us had them as uh, division winners heading into 2022. Both of us had them as division winners heading into this year because we figured, you know, last year they, they didn't make that next step, but this year they will. And they still haven't made that next step. Sure, there's there's still a fairly good team on pace to win, I think, 90 games at this point. But that's not it's it's clearly not good enough. It's clearly not where they need to be. And uh, and yeah, so what I what I put for, you know, if they make the playoffs, it's a sigh of relief because you don't have to face that potential failure and that look in the mirror that would have been necessary if they missed the playoffs. But yeah, if they miss the playoffs, um, there's, there's a lot to look into. Um, you know, there, there are things to blame, you know, the, the lack of the lack of good quality pitching from Alec Manoa. Also just Vladimir Guerrero Jr. has less than one win above replacement right now, according to fan graphs. Like if he has a decent season if, if, and if we're using the wins above replacement model, literally, if he has a decent season, they're probably, you know, very comfortably in the playoff spot instead of just hanging on to one. Um, and maybe even looking at the division a little bit, or maybe that wouldn't still be in question, but they would definitely be comfortably in a playoff spot. And I mean, if they miss the playoffs, like that AL East is still moving and trudging along, whether or not they do anything this off season, they still, they, you know, they have a, pro- they have a high projected payroll this coming off season, but they might have to add more if they indeed miss the playoffs because clearly this squad ain't doing enough. They don't really have, I don't think, a crazy amount coming up through the system. Um, so they would they would need to add more in the off season. Maybe go over the luxury tax. I don't know what the where the owner stance on it is, but I mean, you look at all those teams in the AL East. I think every team is going to make improvements outside of maybe the Rays because of their budget. Um, so the Blue Jays would have to kind of move in that direction as well. Yeah, I mean, there are so many things you can point to that have just not gone right for the Blue Jays this year. We've, you know, we've mentioned Vlad, we've mentioned Alec Manoa, but like the Dalton Varsho trade doesn't look good right now, uh, especially because Gabriel Moreno and Lourdes Gurriel Jr. have exceeded expectations this year. Um, Eric Swanson's been fine, but, you know, Teoscar Hernandez has also had a really good last couple months down the stretch for Seattle. He's been one of the main reasons that Toronto could get knocked out of a playoff spot because, uh, you know, he was a part of Seattle's big run that they had in August, um, towards the end there. And obviously he was traded from the Blue Jays last year. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's, I think they're a team that if they make the playoffs, they have very good potential to be a good sleeper team. Uh, taking on either Tampa Bay or Baltimore or Minnesota in that first round, you know, one of those three or Houston, I suppose it could be as well. I mean, it's weird that <laughs> there's so many potential options of who they're going to face, but, um, you know, I think they are a team that is, has the potential to make a lot of noise. I think as a, I think the baseball world has been kind of waiting for it uh, for a while because, you know, they had, you know, they had their moments to cheer about in game two of the playoffs last year, but, Obviously, they didn't win that game. They blew a 7-1 to lead um, to the Mariners. But, you know, I still think we're really waiting to see the full potential of this Blue Jays team. And we're still going to be having that, even if they make a playoff run, we're still going to be having that conversation throughout the offseason. Yeah, and everyone reflects on playoff baseball in Toronto very positively. Everyone thinks back to 2015 and 16 of, of those amazing moments and how amazing that environment was. Um, and you know, obviously there was fallout after that, but even in the 2018, 2019 area, people were talking about, you know, the, the, you know, Bichette, Biggio and Guerrero for multiple reasons. You know, there was the ironic thing that they were all, um, you know, sons of major leaguers, but also like Nate Pearson was in the mix and P 
people were very excited about all the pieces coming up for the Blue Jays. Uh, they have a very high payroll this year. They added, you know, George Springer and Kevin Gosman, uh, Jose Barrios as well. Chris Bassett this past off season, like they've done all the right things. It's just the, the things on the field and they haven't underperformed by that much, but they've underperformed just enough. Yeah. It definitely doesn't help that. I think the Rays and Orioles have both like far exceeded expectations this year. Um, you know, I think that's kind of caused the blue Jays to uh, regress to what they've become. Um, it definitely doesn't help that, like I said, you know, there are two teams that have just blown everyone away. Uh, I think more than anyone could have really predicted. Um, but, you know, they still have, even with Alec Manoa's departure um, performance wise, you know, Kevin Gosman's still a legitimate playoff ace. Barrios and Bassett will make up the two and three in that rotation. Yusei Kikuchi has been good enough to be a four starter. Um, like they, you know, and the bullpen, you know, has its moments where it's good. You know, I mean, they have guys, they have Eric Swanson, they have Jordan Romano, they have Tim Meza. Um, and the offense, we know what it can be at its potential. We just really haven't seen it. We haven't seen Vlad, you know, truly click this year. We haven't, we, we've seen Matt Chapman have a fantastic April, but he really hasn't been the same since then. Um, Bo Bichette, we, we need to see more out of, you know, I mean, he just got back from an injury and he's kind of struggled since then. So it's understandable. George Springer got unlucky at times this year, but we still expect more out of him. Dalton Varsho, we haven't seen it really out of this year. Um, so, and, and this comes when they, in a year, not to mention where they fix the dimensions of the Rogers center to better accommodate for the Blue Jays offense. Uh, and you know, like Vlad, Vlad Jr. didn't have a home run at home until like July this year. Like it just didn't work out the way that it was supposed to this year, but they still have room to make up for it in the playoffs. But if they don't, that's going to be a really tough look in the off season. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it could be a big look in the mirror. And and yeah, going back to the point of the division, like, you know, we saw the Yankees as the biggest, you know, threats to the Blue Jays in the division. So, yeah, we didn't really expect the Rays and Orioles to be as good as they were. So, yeah, that didn't help didn't help the Blue Jays case in the AL East. But still, you know, with how much the Yankees underperformed also, that should also be a, a thing to get the Blue Jays up in the up in the ranks. But yeah, still just projected, you know, 90, 91 wins this year, uh, which surprisingly enough might not be good enough for a uh, for a playoff spot, um, which is, you know, unfortunate luck of the draw. I mean, in a 12 team playoff format, 90 wins should be enough, but um, who knows? But as as it stands now, they are in a playoff spot. It just is possible that they don't make it. Uh, anything more on the Blue Jays? No, I think I got nothing. That was um, it. I mean, I think in the American League, they're probably the team with the most to lose. Uh, yeah, I would agree, especially considering like they they haven't had you know the World Series in the last few years like the Astros, and that's going to transition into the Astros. Yeah. Um. Who? Yeah. They're they are the defending World Series champs. Um. They were projected to do very well this year. Uh. Most people had them winning the AL West. Uh. You and me included. Um. What do you think about like whether they make or miss the playoffs? What are you know what are what are the uh, takeaways from the Astros season? I mean, just knowing you know history and understanding like how this all works, it makes all the sense in the world that the Astros are going to make the playoffs because you know we've seen them there every year for the last you know six years at this point, right? They haven't missed the ALCS uh, since two thousand sixteen. Um, and I think performance wise, some people might see this maybe as the end of the window with how they've kind of struggled this year. They're 36 and 43 against teams with a winning record, uh, which, you know, when you get to the playoffs, you're only playing teams with a winning record. In fact, you're only playing the good teams with a, with a winning record. You know, you're not playing 82 and 80 teams. Um, you're playing, you know, 86 to 90 win teams at the very least. And at the most you're playing 100 win teams. So you know, I think there's a lot more doubt in the Astros coming into this postseason than there will be in prior postseasons. But, you know, it, it is still the Astros. Um, you know, if they make it, you know, I think it's also a sigh of relief because the Astros have been inevitable for the last six years. And right now, it doesn't feel that way. I mean, they're only a half game up on both the Mariners and Rangers. And if they 
you know, it, it, they can very easily fall out of it by the end of this weekend. Um, but if they get there, right, they still have the core. They still have Altuve. They still have Bregman. They still have Jordan Alvarez. They still have Verlander, or they got Verlander back, rather. They still have Framber Valdez. Like, there's, there's, you know, the guy, they still have Kyle Tucker. Like, all the guys that you know and love from all the playoff runs past, like, they're still there. Yeah, absolutely. And they are, I mean, we obviously know how dangerous they are in the playoffs. They they won the World Series last year and, and made the World Series the year before, despite being a, a two seed there. Um, yeah, so, yeah, as far as, I think if they make the playoffs, that's, you know, meeting expectations, still even being below expectations because a lot of people had them as a 100 win team this year. I know I had them as the one seed in the American League playoffs, which uh, clearly is not going to happen. Um, I think them making the playoffs is a sign of them keeping this run alive. As you mentioned, they've made the last six ALCSs, which is crazy. Um, a miss for me would be almost somewhat fluky. I think narrative wise, it could be the end of the window but looking at what this team has and and what they have going for them that core of position players they're all still doing very well um they all are still relatively like not old you know jose altuve has been amazing since the injury and he's like the oldest of that core of what you could consider that core um like altuve is doing really well jordan alvarez is doing very well Kyle Tucker is emerging as one of the best uh, outfielders in baseball. Uh, and yeah, I mean, also Alex Bregman is, you know, continuing to be a, like now probably a top three third baseman in baseball right now. Um, Jordan Alvarez did uh, miss some time with an injury as well as uh, like pain uh, underperforming as well. Yeah, a little bit. The also the Jose Abreu signing has like yeah. this has played a major role in them underperforming. Like they did not expect him to have negative one wins of replacement and be a very below average bat, uh, which is you know unfortunate. Part of it just the of them underperforming this year has been pitching. Their team ERA plus has gone from one thirty two last year to one oh six this year, which is still above average. But when you go when you're 26% worse as a pitching staff that, you know, leads you to, you know, perform worse on the field and, and, uh, and just win less games overall. So, you know, they're starting pitching and bullpen has not been the same as it was last year. So that's partial, partial to blame, but I still would see it as somewhat fluky because if they miss the playoffs, I still have them as a, um, as a big contender for next year. And, I wouldn't be crazy worried about it. It would just be more of a surprise. I have a hot take. All right, go ahead. If the Astros miss the playoffs this year, Dusty Baker's gone. Wow. Yeah. I think there's a lot, you know, there are plenty of things that didn't go right this year. You know, they lost, you know, they lost Jose Altuve to injury during the World Baseball Classic. They lost Jordan Alvarez during the season. And if, you know, if either of those two things didn't happen, then this team is probably in a much safer spot because those are arguably the two best players on the team that have missed time this year. Uh, and the pitching staff has also underperformed Christian Javier. We I talked about as a slightly alarming at one point this season. Fran Valdez has been fine. Verlander is showing his first signs of aging. Hunter Brown has struggled lately. Uh, you know, they've had to give a bunch of starts to like J.P. Frame. They probably didn't expect to start a lot this year. Brandon Belak, they probably didn't expect a lot to start a lot this year. Uh, Ronel Blanco uh, started a few games. Um, but there are a lot of puzzling decisions that Dusty Baker has made this year. I think the main one is giving uh, Martin Maldonado 385 plate appearances to put up a 67 OPS plus when Yiner Diaz has a 133 OPS plus this year like right. you know i know that like maldonado is you know he's a he's a pitcher's catcher you know he probably you know maybe he is a lower catcher era but i mean when we're talking about a 70 point difference in in ops plus it's hard to keep throwing him out there for that many games yeah yeah for sure it there is there is something there with that um yeah and even even with that i think also like i'm not sure wh where the astros feel like 
Dusty Baker fits in their long term picture because obviously he's just in in general just in nothing to blame on on him. He's an older gentleman. Like you don't know how long in general he's going to be managing yeah. uh, baseball I games. Mean, Dusty Baker was an impromptu hire to begin with, right? Like exactly. You, you know, he was he was never part of their plan, other than when, you know, all of a sudden AJ Hinge got fired because of the scandal, and they had to quickly grab a guy that you know was was going to dissociate them from the scandal. And Dusty Baker was that guy, and you know, I mean, he has you know he's only brought them to the ALCS and nothing less, but um, you know, he's. Like I said, like you said, not a part and was never a part of their long term plan. And with the the division, you know, the division has caught up to them this year. I think that's a pretty easy thing that we can agree on, no matter how these next couple weeks go. Um, because the Astros were a shoe in to win the division every single year. And for the it feels like for the first time, other than 2020, you know, there's there's a toss up here where there's three teams that have a legitimate shot of winning the division. So I think there are adjustments the Astros need to make this offseason to make sure that they are still establishing themselves as, you know, the clear front runner in the AOS. And I think one of those moves is finding a new manager. Yeah, it's possible. I mean, also in 2020, like like Dusty Burke, Dusty Baker's first job was like public relations management basically because he, he yeah. was part of these like press conferences and stuff that to talk about a scandal he was not a part of um i he mean yeah he's done a great job different but... team actually yeah exactly um so yeah he's he's done a great job but yeah i, I wouldn't be surprised if something happened there yeah i mean um, he's already you know he's already won a world series he was like the winningest manager without one you know up until last year um yeah but I think it's very possible that, you know, they they transition to another another helm. Yeah, it'll be it'll be interesting to see if, another if it, regime if that if that happens. Because yeah, the 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 um, Astros in general haven't been afraid to make like you know quick decisions. I mean, they let go of their GM after the year after winning a World Series, yeah. um, or I guess chose not to resign him, but. You know, it seemed like a pretty easy move to get him to to keep him, but that that just uh, didn't happen. Um, so yeah, moving on from the Astros, we have the Mariners. Yes, the Mariners. Um, what do you think about them making or missing the playoffs? Yeah, I mean, if they if they miss the playoffs, like I said, with the Blue Jays, it would be a step back for the organization. You know, I think in twenty twenty two. You know, they were obviously going for a World Series, but they were, I think, happy to be there in the playoffs. There's the element of, you know, they finally ended the 21-year drought. Um, and, you know, they were not the best team in their division. You know, they found their way into the wild card. Um, and they found their way into a playoff series win against Toronto. But, you know, that was, that was you know, when they got eliminated, it was like, all right, well, hey, this is the start. Like, next year is you know, where we build upon this season, we have a full year of Luis Castillo. Uh, we have a full year of George Kirby in that rotation, right? You know, some of the offense is going to develop more. And a lot of this season has kind of gone similar to how last season went, where they struggled out of the gate, kind of middled in mediocrity for a while, and then went on a huge run in the in the middle or late summer um, and then found themselves fighting for a playoff spot in September. So, you know, who knows? Yeah, for sure. Um, if if they make the playoffs for me, I think I think that's meeting expectations. We both had them in the playoffs this year. Um, I think you had them as a four seed and I had them as a five seed or something like that. So we expected them to be comfortably in the playoffs. And like the only the only thing keeping them away from being a clear division winner was the fact that they were in the same division as the Astros. Um, you know, I think in either other division we would have thought them as potential division winners. Um, and I think if they make the playoffs, this also shows just the value of Julio Rodriguez. Like they, the, the, he's been sort of carrying them and carrying their yeah. offense for the past month. Plus, like he has been uh, extraordinarily good uh, at, like in the second half. It's been pretty unbelievable. Um, if they miss the playoffs, I'm not as freaked out about it as if the blue jays missed the playoffs because there's a lot of young controllable players that are 
good with the uh good with the Mariners where whereas the Blue Jays are more veteran stacked um the Mariners have a lot of you know cheap young controllable talent I think the oldest uh pitcher in that rotation right now is Luis Castillo at the age of 30 like that that rotation which kind of makes their team is mostly constructed of guys like 26 and younger like Logan Gilbert George Kirby uh Brian Wu uh uh, was it Brian? Is it Bryce or Brian Miller? I, I forget. Bryce Miller. Bryce Miller. Um, yeah, like they have a good core there. I think missing the playoffs would, and this is still the case if they make if they make the playoffs. I think it may show a need for offensive reinforcements. Uh, we've talked about how their offense is sort of the weak point of that team, and I don't know what quality of bats are out there, but they probably will need to get uh, some sort of bat whether it be in the trade market or um through free agent pref- you know pr- preferably a free agent and not a situation where you have to sacrifice a good piece uh to get that bat which is what they did with Te- Teoscar Hernandez you know they traded Eric Swanson for him uh which is a good reliever out of their bullpen you know I I would want them to get a free agent bat this year uh maybe someone like Cody Bellinger um out in the outfield cuz you know they they've always needed some good outfield bats but but yeah I think it would just show you know, they need to get more if they miss this, if they miss these playoffs. I mean, Teoscar Hernandez is literally going to be a free agent this year. That's true. Yeah. So they can re-sign <laughs> him. And right. you know, given the way that he's played down the stretch, I think the Mariners might be inclined to do so. Um, because if they make the playoffs, you know, the run that he went on while they were hot is going to be a large reason why. Um, who else do they have hitting free agency this year? Do they have anyone else? Yeah, nothing from the starting pitching side, I don't think. No, definitely not. Yeah. You know, I can't imagine Logan Gilbert is hitting free right. agency. Um, nothing else really, nothing that's of meaningful value. Um if they miss the playoffs, I think they'll they will have missed Rodney Ray, who obviously got Tommy John surgery this year. You know, that was the guy that they paid to be their ace. Um yeah. and you know, maybe he's not the best pitcher in this rotation right now, even if he was in it, but he certainly makes them a better team and you know they're at a point right now where they just need to be a little bit better right I mean they're you know half a game in or out of a playoff spot whether no matter how you look at it you know you could look at this glass half empty glass half full with this team kind of right now um and if they had Robbie Ray you know making a couple starts instead of you know maybe Marco Gonzalez down the stretch who I think they DFA'd um you know maybe this is a lot different Right. I mean, yeah, whether or not he was in Cy Young form in 2022, he was still, you know, ERA well under four at three, seven, one, and also ate up a bunch of innings as well. Okay, no, he's, he's on the 60 day IL. He did not get DFA'd Mark Gonzalez. Um, yeah, with Robbie Ray, like he was an innings eater and he had a three, seven, one ERA, uh, in 2022 and, and obviously showed potential in 2021 to do even better. So yeah, who knows who, how that would have gone. Um, yeah. Anything more on the Mariners? Um, I feel like there is more. I don't know. Uh, I think, I mean, yeah, what they have to gain is kind of meeting their expectation. If they lose, it's def- if they don't make it, it's definitely a missed opportunity that might be looked back on in the grand scheme of things whenever this window of theirs closes. Um, mm-hmm. But it's also not the end of the world because, you know, if the Blue Jays miss the playoffs, we're, we're counting how many years they have left. The Mariners have a lot, a much higher number, I think. Um, but you know, this is definitely not, you know, this is an opportunity. This might be the best shot they ever get at the division. Uh, because, you know, I know the Astros, you know, they look mortal this year, but you know, there's always, you know, there's always the Astros, right. The Rangers, uh, you know, have room for improvement. Uh, and you know, they'll probably address whatever they need to address in the off season. So this might be the best shot that the Mariners have. Right. Uh, with the, with the Mariners, like Mariners talking Mariners versus Blue Jays, both if they, you know, either one is one is going to miss the playoffs, one is going or one may miss the playoffs, one will definitely make the playoffs. Um, you know, co- to compare them missing the playoffs, one, you know, both both will be missing the playoffs in their window, but the Mariners have more years left in their window than the Blue Jays do. Yeah. Um. Uh, I think the Mariners well. are 
only playing meaningful games from here on out, by the way. Like, I know that every game is meaningful, but they're only playing games against teams that they absolutely need to beat. Um, You know, they played Oakland this week, and I called that series a must-sweep, and they did it. They went in and swept Oakland to their credit. You know, no matter what the competition is, sweeping a team is never easy. Uh, But, you know, now you have to go at the minimum six and four, I'd say, in your last ten games because you're facing only the Rangers and Astros. Uh, Anything more than that is absolutely a bonus, but I think six and four – probably gets you into the playoffs considering that when you win the other teams are losing right and and also like yeah part of part of the competition are teams that yeah like part of the teams in their way are teams that they are facing so Mm -hmm. naturally if they win against those teams those teams playoff odds are going to go down because they're losing ground um specifically rangers and astros um yeah and speaking of the rangers that's that's the last american league team we have to talk about in the meaning of their playoff uh, make or miss, you know, potential. And yeah, for the Rangers, you know, I'll, I'll start off by saying if they make, if they make the playoffs, um, it shows great vindication for, you know, what they've been doing organizationally for the past couple of years shows vindication for that high payroll. I mean, they're spending like $250 million on that team, which props to them. Uh, Not going to knock them for that. Uh, also shows vindication for their buy now trade deadline moves, you know, getting Max Scherzer, also getting Jordan Montgomery, specifically Montgomery, because, you know, he's a free agent after this year. You know, I think it's a low likelihood that they resign him at the end of the year. Um, and also it shows the emergence of a, you know, a young core that is also developing along with their great veterans with uh, Josh Young, Leota Tavares and Ezekiel Duran, who I learned today they got from the Joey Gallo trade, which is so props yes, to did. them for that. Yes, um, they did. Yeah. Um, but yeah, what what else do you, what other thoughts do you have on the, uh, on the Rangers? Um, yeah. I mean, this is a team that, you know, I think a lot of people would agree was ahead of schedule. Um, I think they have, uh, I think they have the least amount to lose out of the four AL teams. Um, you know, Corey Seager, has been an MVP this year. Obviously, he's not going to win it because Shohei exists, but he's probably going to be the MVP runner-up. Even with the time he missed due to injury this year, he's been, like, I don't think people realize how crazy he's been this year. Um, He's, like, just going to, he's barely going to hit the plate appearance qualifier because he's seven away right now. But Corey Seager's hitting 331 this year. Um, He's a 1029 OPS, a 637 slugging. Like, that's crazy. Um, he has 42 doubles in only 441 at bats, uh, which leads the American League, by the way. Yeah, and also 31 home runs. Yeah, and the guys, the guys, 29 this year. Mm-hmm. Right. So, like, you can rely on this for you. Could, you could rely on his window of success for a few years at least. Yeah. Yeah. For. For me, like them missing the playoffs, like I think whether they make or miss, you can't say that they didn't go for it organizationally. You can't say, oh, it's because they were too hesitant at the deadline. Like that's not going to be a narrative that's going to be said about the Rangers. Um, And I don't even like if they miss the playoffs, I can't fault anything they've really done organizationally. Like I I can't even say that buying was the wrong that buying so hard was the wrong thing to do because yeah they're they're really close they made every move they sh- you know possibly could have made um and like yeah letting go of like Luis on Helicuña for Max Scherzer like that's I, I think that's still a good move even with the injury and everything like he's he's back next year too so like that's I think that will end up a good move for the Rangers as well as the Mets. I think it'll be a good move for both teams, but, um, but yeah, like I, I think it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a thing where, yeah, you can't say they didn't go for it. And also with the Rangers, if they miss, they still have, they still have most of their significant pieces for next year. Like the only real significant pieces that they'll be missing that, that are going into free agency next year are Jordan Montgomery. Um, even like if you want to call a role, does Chapman a significant piece, uh, there's him. Um, Martin Perez is going into free agency, but he hasn't really been that significant this year. But uh, but yeah, I mean, they have Scherzer coming back. 
maybe DeGrom is going to be there at the end of the year, but you can't rely on that. But also like all those young pieces with Josh Young, Duran, Tavares, those signings with not to mention, Yeah, not to mention Evan Carter and Wyatt Langford that are going to be playing bigger roles next year. Yes, those two as well. Um, you also have Marcus Simeon and Corey Seager, arguably the most the two most valuable players on the team. You know, they're gonna be still in their early 30s next year and probably producing next year. Uh, Max Scherzer will be back. Um, Nathan Ivaldi will be back, as well as yeah, Adolis Garcia uh is gonna be back. So so yeah, I mean they have most of what they will have next year if they do indeed miss the playoffs, but who knows that may not happen. Um, it's, I think all, it seems like all four teams have like the same exact odds. Uh, it's pretty yeah, crazy. It feels, but, it feels um, that way. It's weird. Yeah. It's funny because only one of them is going to miss the playoffs. Yeah. And it's, you know, so it feels like there's like a 75% chance for each team, you know, if you average it out. Um, right. And yeah, I mean, it's, you kind of just got to pick one. Yeah. It's, it's, it's weird. It is weird. Um, it'll be it'll be fun to watch though from a fan perspective. Um, yeah. Anything more on the Rangers before we get into the NL teams? Yeah, I mean, I think the Rangers are the team, like I said, with the least amount to lose. You know, I think if they, I think no matter what happens, they're gonna, you know, reassess this off season and make more moves that are gonna make them a better team. You know, going into twenty twenty four. Um, and I think with this year, like they've set themselves up to be a potential division favorite heading into twenty twenty four. Which is crazy because, yeah. you know, this team lost, they lost 94 games last year. Um, like they, they, they came from kind of nothing this year to become a division contender and a playoff contender on September 22nd and beyond. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And yeah, I can't even, I can't even like um, say it if they missed, I can't even say it's necessarily like a choke job or anything. Like they've been, yeah below unless been, uh, it's like unless like they get up by like three games in the last weekend and then like get swept by the mariners or something right um i know i i checked uh before the show they are 44 and 48 since june 6th but i mean like that's where i expected them to be <laughs> for the whole season like never Which maybe maybe that does cause some concern because they played two-thirds of the season being below 500 but you know i still think there's a lot this team has to look forward to. Yeah. And there's, there's still overall in the season, 16 games above 500 and, and yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things to be optimistic about, but yeah, I mean, people could point to like, yeah, since June 6th or even since the start of June, like they've been sort of a middling team, but that's where I expected them to be. I expected this to be a bridge year for the Rangers and and now yeah. they're right now they're playoff contenders. So by the way, I can't even I... say I give mentioned too much this criticism name. on that. I mentioned this name very briefly earlier. Have you seen Wyatt Langford's stats in the minors this year? Uh yes. Yes. Yeah. I I think I think like Foolish Baseball t- may have tweeted them out without context or like Petriello he's, he's or something. He's already he got drafted this year, third overall, and he's in triple A. Which <laughs> like again, he's 21 years old in triple A. Uh, coming out of a three-year college uh, at Florida, and he uh, is five and a half years younger than the average AAA player, and he only has only played three games there, yes, but he has an 1171 OPS, and overall in the minors between four different levels, uh, rookie ball, high A, double A, and, and AAA, um, he has an 1171 OPS as well. Yeah, I don't want to call my shot too early, but this 2023 MLB draft class has the potential to be like one of the best ever. I think a lot of, then this is something I'll probably get into at other points, but like, I think a lot of teams are kind of starting to realize that if you draft like a really good college bat, like you can probably just like let them zip through the minors if they're good enough, because like there are a lot of players that were drafted this year, specifically out of college in the first round that are going to be in the majors next year. Like Paul Skeen's, going to be in the majors next year. Dylan Cruz going to be in the majors next year. Wyatt Langford, Kyle Teal, Jacob Wilson could be like a September call up next year. Like there are so many guys and there are definitely more than I didn't name, but like there are already guys that are in double a for countless organizations. And next year, 
there's a very college heavy draft class. So I think a lot of teams are going to take advantage of that and like aim for guys that are going to be on their 2025 roster. Right. Yeah. Shanwell will definitely be on the angels next year. He's yes, already up there. Noel and Shanwell, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, it just feels like this year specifically, it, there is a long list of guys that are just killing the minors this year. And I feel like that just doesn't happen every year. No. Um, but uh, so yeah, I mean, it, it'll be fun. But yeah, that's a little little tangent there. But the Rangers have a lot to look no, forward to. With, I'm going to be Langford. I'm going to be a huge nerd for next year's draft class. Oh yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> I've yeah. seen like ten of them play. The way I am very mildly into college basketball now because of who Paul. Yeah. Daniel will be a college baseball and an MLB draft fiend. Because yeah. of uh, all the players he came in contact with. I used to make fun of like the MLB exclusive fans that like got into college baseball in like that one weekend in February and then like just kind of forgot about it. Like as yeah. soon as spring training started, it's like, no, I'm actually going to no, I'm going to be that guy now. Right. <laughs> like I'm going to be up at like on February like 26th. I'm going to be up at like 11 o'clock watching Oregon State. Right. <laughs> versus Stanford. Actually, yep. it definitely won't be. It'll be Oregon State versus a non-conference opponent, but or Stanford versus a non-conference opponent. But you get the idea. Yeah, it'll be. Yeah, Oregon State versus like Cal, Berkeley, uh, <laughs> Los Angeles. Some yeah weird versus like UC Irvine. Right. Exactly. Um, Actually, for for personal reasons, if if UC Irvine and or and Oregon State play each other, like I'm all locked in on those matchups. Yep. Yep. Shout out to Travis Pizana. Travis Pizana um, and Joe Oyama. Yep. Yep. Um, so yeah, that's that's those are the American League teams that we are talking about. And you know, the 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 narrative of them making the playoffs and the narrative of them missing the playoffs. Uh as far as the National League goes, it is a little bit more wide open. I think most most of the teams we're talking about here don't have a crazy amount to lose here. Uh, as far as you know what how their organization is going to be seen because i mean the teams that had the most to lose are kind of almost you know already out of the playoff race most most notably with the mets but also the padres you know unless they go unless they continue the seven game win streak into a 17 game win streak um they will most likely be out of the playoff race as well and we all know the implications of them missing the playoffs we've talked about it a bunch but um, as far as the, we'll start with the Diamondbacks who have the most comfortable position out of anyone not named the Brewers, Dodgers, Phillies, or Braves. Um, but with the Diamondbacks, they are, I think, two and a half up on the first team out of the playoffs and two up on the three seed. Um, or, or no, I think two, or yeah, two up on both. But um, what do you, what's, what are the narratives we will be talking about with the Diamondbacks, you know, whether they make or miss the playoffs? So they're actually in like pretty much the safest spot out of any of the, uh, out of any of the wild card teams. They swept their series against the Giants week, which was huge. They're two games ahead of the Cubs and the Marlins uh, for that uh, second wild card and only three games behind the Phillies for the first wild card. So like, who knows? They could theoretically sneak into that four seed uh even at this point because yeah. uh you know they've won five in a row but this diamondbacks team has been very impressive like i think they looked they looked dead to rights in like july and early august when they were uh playing like some of the worst baseball in the league and they've come back from that to clinch uh you know a non-losing record they're 81 and 72 right now and you know, they've overcome so much to get to a point where they are the safest team in this wild card race right now, uh, which I think looks really impressive for them come playoff time. You know, I know that playoff experience matters and the Diamondbacks have kind of none of it. Um, but I think it's a team that is worth investing in, not just in the future, but this year. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think if they make the playoffs, you know, this is a sign of an early arrival. Um, it's a sign that they have something with the young core considering, you know, Corbin Carroll obviously is the main, you know, head of that. 
along with uh, Gabriel Moreno, uh, also Jordan Lawler, who just came up, and, you know, Brennan Fodd, Ryan Nelson, guys that are probably going to be good in the future. Um, I think it's also if they make this, whether or not they make make the playoffs or not, um, I think it's a signal the success, the overall success of the team is a signal to invest more in the team, like financially. Uh, I think they have, you know, a bottom 10 payroll right now. Um, and this looks to be a winning team for, you know, the next few years, maybe even, but maybe even beyond that. So, you know, the, the Diamondbacks have done it before by, you know, signing, got signing a guy like, uh, Zach Granke for over $200 million. Like maybe they need to go out into the free agent market and, and get some more reinforcements to, uh, invest further in the team and maybe even compete for a division, uh, at some point in the near future. So, so yeah, I think either way it's a sign that like, yeah, this is, this is a team worth investing in. Um, and yeah, and if they, if they miss the playoffs, it's sort of a, a bit of a blown opportunity. They have, uh, an, their playoff odds at the moment are 86% right now. Um, but other than that, there's not, there's not much to go into the idea of them missing the playoffs because I mean, neither of us had them in the playoffs this year. So, you know, it wouldn't be the biggest deal in the world. It would just be like, you know, kind of a shame because they are sort of an exciting team. And just from a fan perspective, just it wouldn't be the best. But but yeah, other than that, it's not not too much to look into if they miss the playoffs. Yeah, no doubt. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, they've kind of had a youth movement throughout the year, right, where Corbin Carroll has been the face of that team and arguably the best player on the team. You know, Zach Gallen, who is a little bit more established, but only 27 is, you know, the ace of that staff, a Cy Young caliber pitcher. Um, I know that he's kind of struggled lately, but, you know, he still has a 338 fifth. You know, you like that going into the playoffs. Um, Gabriel, Gabriel Moreno has been really good for them as a defensive catcher and also has a 107 OPS plus, um, which is exciting. Cattell Marte has kind of resurged this year. He's still under 30. Like the only consistent bat that they really have that's in their 30s is Christian Walker, who has struggled recently, but you know has been an excellent bat throughout the season and is going to be a guy that is kind of the you know the clubhouse, I guess, like tenured leader on that on that team, right? I mean, he was there in 2019. As, that's as early as I remember. Uh, 20 yeah, 2017 actually. So he was on the team, and he probably wasn't on the roster, but he was on the team that made it to the playoffs in 17. Yeah. Yeah. Right. 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 Um, also, I think what the Diamondbacks might want to look into uh, in the off season is extending Zach Gallen because he has two years left to control right now. Um, and yeah, I mean, young control, you know, a young pitcher that's already talented and already figured out major league hitting to an extent uh, is extremely valuable. So I think the Diamondbacks should hop in on that. Um because, you know, if he gets out to the free agent market, it would be hard to match the other teams, albeit, you know, it would be after 2025. But still, like, that's something that should be on the Diamondbacks checklist. Uh, and they've already done that with some of their pieces. They've done that with Cattell Marte and Corbin Carroll, which is a good sign, you know, always good to do that. So kind of continue that trend with, with Zach Gallen at the end of the season. Um Either way, whether they make or miss the playoffs, I think some of these narratives can apply to whether they make or miss the playoffs. But um, yeah, overall, it's been a pretty successful season for Arizona. Um, so yeah, anything more on the Diamondbacks? Um, it's pretty remarkable, I think, just that this team has rebounded so well from how bad they were um, at that one point in the season. They do have our negative run differential. Um but I don't really care about that right now. Um, yeah, no, I think it's pretty remarkable what they've done. Right, 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 right. Um, so now the, so now uh, talking about the Cubs who are seventy nine and seventy four right now. Um, they've had a real interesting sort of roller coaster season. They've gone from a middling team to a sort of bad team to a really good team that had. 92 percent playoff odds at one point this year to now a team that's you know just hanging on and you know they've lost 10 of the last 13 but they still have a spot in the playoff race i believe um or are tied for a spot in the playoff race and uh and yeah i mean they, they've kind of gone full circle in some form or fashion 
Uh, what do you think about the narratives of, you know, them making or missing the playoffs? So real quick for the NL teams, do we have the Cubs, Marlins, Reds and Giants? Uh, just Cubs, Marlins and Reds for me. Oh, so we're cutting the Giants out of this. You know, if <laughs> if they no, can. I'm, listen, they... I'm not saying we need to have them. They're literally under 500, but just just for clarity so I can have this take. Right. OK. OK. The next three teams we're going to talk about, I think it, it go, goes back to the same narrative of. You know they're outperforming their expectations this year, and a playoff, ex- you know, and, and a playoff appearance would be considered a win for this season. I think the Cubs have the most to lose between the them, the Marlins, and the Reds. Yeah. Um, this is you know a team that has lost seven of their last ten. I uh, I think this is a team that is the best team of the Diamondbacks, Cubs, Marlins, Reds, Giants. Uh, you know that conglomerate of. Uh, potential wild card teams but you know I think obviously going into the season they were they were kind of expected to maybe hover 500 at most you know it was expected the Cardinals and Brewers would be running the division the Cardinals did not hold up their end of that bargain obviously uh enter the Cubs who are 79 and 74 who have had you know Cody Bellinger breaking out this year who have had Justin Steele breaking out this year um Kyle Hendricks has kind of resurged to become uh, you know, a fraction of the picture that he was in around 2016 or so. And, you know, that era, um, you know, like this has been, you know, say Suzuki has done extremely well lately. Um, I think this is a team that has a very good opportunity to make a run this year. Um, Yeah, they, they've, they've been surprising, like seeing some of the veterans that have emerged and, you know, kind of, Re- rewritten their you know re- rewritten their careers a little bit in a in a sense has been you know pretty fascinating i think if the cubs make the playoffs uh it shows some vindications for some of the signings they've had in the past couple off seasons i think people so, sort of some people like me were thinking like it's interesting that the cubs are like going after free agents at this point considering like they're not really in a in a competitive window right now like you know, they're they're signing some of these guys just to not make the playoffs, but that could be very much different if they do make the playoffs. You know, these signings like Dansby Swanson, Marcus Stroman, Seiya Suzuki, and Cody Bellinger, those are the reasons that they are in this race and and they are potentially making the playoffs. Like, especially like Bellinger, like a, that was a low risk move. Um, and you know, it was what, seventeen million dollars or something like that. And yeah. you know, he's been extremely valuable to he that non tendered. Yeah, he was non-tendered and he was on a one-year deal. Uh, and yeah, he's been extremely valuable. Say Suzuki has, you know, turned the page on what people thought of him and and has been excellent since the first week of uh of August. Uh Marcus Stroman has been pretty good throughout the contract, and Dansby Swanson has been uh very valuable th- throughout the year, continued to be one of the best gloves at the shortstop position, as well as a valuable bat. Um, so I think a make you know, making the playoffs for them is a credit to, you know, sort of ownership for not, you know, losing for, for not just using this non-competitive window as an excuse not to spend and also general management for, you know, believing in the team and, and showing a, you know, just, just, just showing a general sense of belief and, and, uh, you know, adding to the team when maybe a lot of people were thinking they were in a non-competitive window like myself. Uh, I think a miss would be it would show a bit of a se- September collapse. They had ninety two percent playoff odds on September sixth. Um, yep, I was I literally have the graph pulled up. Yep. So yeah, on September sixth they had ninety two percent playoff odds. I think it would be kind of a, a a bit of a choke job if they don't make the playoffs here. But yeah, also, I mean it's their playoff odds are already down to thirty three percent right now. Um, right. If if you're wondering why, it's because since September sixth, they've gone three and ten, for the worst yep. for tied for the worst record in Major League Baseball, the worst record in the National League. Um, and luckily for them, in that time, only the Diamondbacks have really like broken out. Like if you look at all the other teams, the Marlins are seven and seven, the Reds are six and six, the Giants are six and seven. Like they're lucky to still be in a playoff spot at this point. Yeah. Very true. Very true. Um. So yeah, as far as the Cubs go, I mean, it would be a choke job for this year, but 
I think they have some things to look forward to in the future. I just looked up like farm system rankings. Fangraphs has the Cubs as the best farm system in baseball. MLB.com has them fourth best. So they have a good farm system coming up. They have most of the pieces that uh, propelled them to this spot, you know, coming back next year uh, other than like Bellinger and maybe Stroman. Cause I think he's on a player option this year, but Stroman might also come back. Um, but also they could resign Bellinger and, and, you know, make him a mainstay in the Cubs organization. So I don't think it would be the biggest deal if they, if they miss the playoffs, but it would look bad considering how much of a shoe in they were sort of Supposed to as be. a playoff team um, on September 6th. Yeah, um, I think, yeah, it's weird. They have a lot to gain and a lot to lose, um, but also at the same time, a little to gain and little to lose. Um, yeah. Because, you know, if they sneak into the playoffs, you know, they I think they have a very good shot of making a run, but it's not a great shot. Um, but also, you know, if they miss the playoffs, you know, I in the grand scheme of things, if you look at it from a this year entirely perspective, I don't think it's the end of the world. I think it gives them a lot of pressure to re-sign Cody Bellinger. Um who's, you know, probably the top free agent bat that's going to be out there, not named Shohei Otani. Right. You know? Right, exactly, exactly. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's depending on what <laughs> on what scale you measure it by, they're, out, they're either outperforming or underperforming expectations. Like, yeah. I think if you look at it before the season, they're outperforming our expectations. Like, we probably pegged them as both as, as a below 500 team. And as long as they win two more games for the rest of the year, that won't be the case. Um, and then, you know, if we, I think they were 10 games below 500 or 11 games below 500 at some point this year, we would not be thinking that they were going to be in this playoff race at all. But then again, like on September 6th, they're 12 games above 500 and 92% playoff odds. So that would be underperforming our expectations from that point forward. And, you know, being you know kind of you know letting letting people down and and not and not making the playoffs when they should have by that point but like looking at on a longer scale the fact that they got to that point is is you know pretty remarkable in general so it depends it really just depends how you look at it and what scale you you base it off of you know uh in like Wii Sports Golf when you're like on a par 3 and like you hit a shot from the tee box that like almost goes in the hole, but it doesn't. But like the crowd does like the, the, Oh, like that kind of thing. Yeah. That's the cub season. If they miss the playoffs, I can, I can get down with that. I can get like, you know, get that, that you know, you can look at it as like, Oh man, like they, they almost had it. Like it, that was a, that was a crazy shot that they, that they had, but also like they're setting themselves up nicely for the future, you know, like, yeah, you do, you do miss that shot, but you got an easy you got an easy birdie right there. I yeah, I like that take. I think that's yeah. that's the best we sports golf analogy that we've ever had on 272 episodes of this show. Without a doubt, I mean it's it's probably a I don't know what seconds. Yeah, it, I don't think I don't know if don't there is a second. I don't I don't think there's anything that, that beats that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so shout out to our our old college roommate David Gilburn, by the way. Yeah, David, uh, David Kilburn, <laughs> golf, golf champion. I think he was the last one to do it in the townhouse. Yeah. Um, the Marlins, uh, the Marlins are an interesting, interesting organization. Uh, I'll start with the Marlins by saying like, if they make the playoffs, I think we would both agree. This is sort of a mark of accomplishment for Kim Ng, you know, obviously, uh, famous for, being the first female general manager in uh in baseball and you know just even you take away that part it's still a it's this is a market of an accomplishment considering you know this team uh won 69 games last year and part of part of why they're in the position they're in is is some of the offseason moves that they've made uh whether it be uh this past offseason at this trade deadline uh at a at the 2021 trade deadline or even at the, uh, even I think in the 2021 to 22 off season, uh, you look at some of the pieces that are getting them there. Uh, most notably Luis, Luis Arise and both Daniel and I would acknowledge that that's 
been a pretty even trade up to this point, but we would both also agree that the Marlins needed offense much more than they needed started pitching. So overall, it's been a pretty good trade for the Marlins. Uh, along with that, Jorge Soler has been a big part of why they're in the position they're in. That was an offseason signing heading into the 2022 season. Uh, Jesus Lazardo has been a fantastic uh, contributor to the Marlins, maybe their best starting pitcher this year. And uh, he was a trade. He was part of a trade uh, where Kim Ng was the, you know, was the dealer in that and traded off Starling Marte for him. Uh, and then also you have Jake Berger and Josh Bell were both acquired at this at this past trade deadline. Both have been really positive contributors for them. And even someone who uh, isn't an above average bat this year, but still has been just an overall um, above replacement contributor uh, with Brian De La Cruz, who was uh who was acquired for Yimmy Garcia back in back in 2021. So I think just it would be a mark of an accomplishment for the front office there in Miami if they were to make the playoffs this year. If the Marlins make the playoffs, I think it's pretty safe to say that between August 1st and October 1st, the Marlins were the winners of the trade deadline. True. Right? I mean, like, because, you know... Obviously, the you for the trade deadline, you 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 try to evaluate trades for more than just what happened the, for the rest of the regular season because, you know, maybe Jack Flaherty goes out and dominates in the postseason for the Orioles and wins them a World Series. Maybe Justin Verlander returns the Cy Young form in the playoffs. Like, there's obviously many different things that can happen in the postseason, but I think from trade deadline through the end of the regular season, if the Marlins make the playoffs, they had the best trade deadline in the league. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that's not even to say that these were complete buy now decisions. I mean, Josh Bell mm-hmm. is, uh, I think, supposed to so, supposed to be under contract next year. Jake Berger is under control for like four more years after this or even yeah, like, like that's five a, more that's years a after this. Trade. Yeah. Like, yeah, I mean, the, it looks really good for for the Marlins right now. And like, yeah, if not for those if not for those trades, they're probably not as close to a position as that, especially considering they were lacking offensively. They've always sort of been lacking offensively. They got two bats and they have been big upgrades in that lineup and taking away some of those weak spots because they, they had plenty of them. Yeah. Um, so, and yeah, and if they miss the playoffs, uh, if they miss the playoffs, I think it's just more, and this could go either direction if they make or miss the playoffs it's sort of a sign to invest more in the team uh they do have the ninth lowest payroll in baseball they're, they're barely cracking 100 million dollars this year um and at one point in marlin's history believe it or not that was not the case um so yeah i mean they're they're maybe potentially entering a competitive window in a competitive division so maybe they need to crack open the the checkbooks a little more um whether or not they make or miss the playoffs uh, but this upcoming off season, maybe get a, a, a decent free agent out there that could help the team, particularly another bat, something, something somewhere that's going to help their offense because uh, that's where they need it. But, but yeah, anything more with the Marlins? I don't remember if I covered this exact topic on the Marlins. It might've been another team. I know I did something like this similarly recently, but uh, between Nick Fortes, Joey Wendell, Gene Segura and Jacob Stallings, the Marlins have, uh, given about 1,200 plate appearances at, to players with a weighted runs with an OPS plus below 60. Yeah, I, I think uh, that has been mentioned in some form or fashion, which is crazy. Yeah, like that's again below 60. Yeah, that's 1,200 so, plate appearances. That's you know more than that's almost 10. percent That's more than 10. percent I think of the total number of plate appearances from getting an exact number. Uh, that's 21% of the team's plate appearances going to below 60 weighted runs created plus or. OPS yeah. Plus, and the, basically the same, the like below, like the below replacement threshold or the replacement threshold is around like 75 to 80. Yeah. And they are much below that below replacement threshold. Um, which is pretty crazy. So yeah, I mean, investing more in that lineup financially would would uh, propel them to uh, much more success, especially in such a competitive division. Um, all right. So now that leads us into Cincinnati, 
um, who I think out of all these teams came into the 2023 season with the least ex, you know, least amount of expectations. Um, I think if they make the playoffs, that should be an automatic manager of the year for David Bell. Can like I go back to the Marlins real quick? Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry about that, but Skip Schumacher, I feel like we should also give some love to. I mean, he's yeah. he inherited kind of the same roster that Don Mattingly had last year. Um, plus, you know, he's getting less contributions from Sandy Alcantara this year, generally speaking. You know, he's had to go through a lot of different guys and different scenarios, but, like, he's he's made it work all season. So, like, that's, you know, I think, you know, you just mentioned – if the Reds make the playoffs, it's an automatic manager of the year for David Bell. I think if the Marlins make the playoffs, it might be an automatic manager of the year for Skip Schumacher, a guy within the first year of his job, uh, you know, m- finding a way to win games for his team. Yeah, I would I would agree with both of those as long as they don't make the playoff, as long as one of them doesn't make the playoffs. Yes. Yeah. Um. Otherwise, if both make the playoffs, it's it's really it's like a Spider Man meme almost. Like, whoa, yeah. what's going on here? Yeah, but, well, uh, I mean, there's, it's pretty unlikely that both of them make the playoffs at this point. Yes, I, I would agree. Not with that. impossible, but not likely. Not likely, yeah, um, yeah. With the Reds, you know, they're an extremely exciting team, just because it's like you don't know who's gonna make that contribution that night. You don't know why. You you don't know why they're gonna win that night, but you know they may they may just find a way to do it. Um, and yeah, I think yeah, if they make the play if they make the playoffs should be an automatic manager of the year f- for David Bell, considering the fact that they were project they were probably like projected to be like a 100 loss team or at least a 95 loss team this year. Uh they didn't really add much. They have only been losing pieces since like the end of 2021. Uh yet, you know, if they make the playoffs, that's that that is an amazing accomplishment for the Reds. Uh, it's partially a product of a great 2022 trade deadline. Uh, and shout out to you. You you kind of introduced me to the to how absurd the Reds yep. 2022 trade deadline was. But getting, you know, Spencer Steer and Christian Ar- and Carnacio and Strand, who are both making contributions this year, uh, you know, for a in a Tyler Molle trade, like that looks incredibly good for the front office. Also, you know, Noel V. Marte is is making contributions this year for the Reds. Uh, he was acquired in the Luis Castillo trade. So, yeah, I mean, I think it would look good for the front office, look good for management uh, and look good for that really young core, which has many, many pieces. It seems like almost every position is acquired with some guy who's like 24 or younger and looks like they're going to be a stud. So would be a very early arrival. And yeah, if they miss the playoffs, I don't think it really is. It means anything like for it, it would be a bummer for sure for Reds fans, but I think it wouldn't be really a disappointment. I think overall they have far exceeded expectations. Even if they lose every single game for the rest of the year, they've still far exceeded expectations for the 2023 season. Yeah, no, I would agree with that. Um, but yeah, uh, anything more? I on think, the Reds? I think the one thing that you can really look back on, and this is not like a management thing. It's not a general management thing, but like, I think the really, if they miss the playoffs, the one thing you can really go back and wonder is like, what if the starting pitching stayed healthy? Because, yeah. you know, we talked about the big three, you know, in, in terms of the young pitchers, the Reds had this year with green Lodolo and Ashcraft, all three of them have seen time on the IL this year. Lodolo has seen like three starts all year. Uh, Ashcraft is out for the year. Green, looks like he's recovering from his injury nicely. He had like 14 strikeouts the other day, but you know, he did still miss some time. You know, they had to give, you know, how many starts did they give to, you know, guys that like just, you don't see pitching a lot for competing teams. Like Luke Weaver off the top of my head, you know, had a, had a 687 with the Reds and he started 21 games for them. Yeah. Right. Like, you know, and there's probably several others I can point to, uh, I'm going through their roster right now, but like uh, Ben Lively has a 5.51 ERA. He started 12 games for the Reds. Like there, you know, there's probably a lot of names that you can point to and been like, I wish they didn't give that many starts to that guy. Right, exactly. Those are really the only two. Maybe Brandon Williamson, but I think he's been all right. Like he's, yeah. like, he's been an average starter. Yeah, and that's part of what makes me think like David Bell, if they make the playoffs, is such a favorite to win 
you know, National League Manager of the Year. And even if they miss the playoffs, I think he's a great candidate because like, you know, I think I mentioned uh, when we were doing our first half awards, like I think he had to use the most pitchers with 10 plus innings out of anyone in the National League. Um, So that includes starters, relievers, whatnot. But like also like the only one of the only things to just look forward to on that team that year was Hunter Green and Nick Lodolo. Like those were two pieces that looked to have a lot of promise last year that, you know, it didn't seem like they didn't have, it didn't seem like they had much coming up this year to look forward to that team. And he lost those two guys. Like those were one of the two of the only guys that you really wanted to see on this Reds team perform. Um, and he lost them, but they're still continuing to to thrive forward and you know potentially still make a playoff spot which is unbelievable yeah by the way led la cruz uh slugging under 400 yeah that's unfortunate tough yeah he is uh very fast though and he does throw the ball very hard yeah i mean it would be fun to see him in the playoffs no doubt well I mean, like, I don't think it's I don't think it's fair to blame him if they miss the playoffs because he is still 21 years old playing his first season. Yeah. But also, as, like, he has had a pretty steep drop off drop off this year. As much as like, and we probably haven't expressed it on the podcast as much, but sometimes we talk about like how much, you know, hype he gets for, you know, so not being that productive a player. The pressure shouldn't be on shouldn't be on no. him at this point in his career. <laughs> Like he's 21, um, him being, you know, even I think we would call him like an average player considering base running, uh, hitting and, uh, in defense, like overall been a pretty average player this year, but you know, people propel and he's, you know, an exciting piece. Yeah. He's fun. Like there's no doubt about it. If you don't think he's fun, like, I don't know what you're watching. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, we just see like a lot of potential and we're excited for his age, you know, 24, 25 seasons, but yeah, this year it just hasn't, you know, it hasn't been uh, all that great. Um, but still better than a lot of 21 year olds, which is, which is nice. Um, all right. Yeah. Anything more on the reds? I think that's kind of all I had. All right. Well, those, uh, that's talking about playoff you know potential bubble playoff teams what it means for them to make the playoffs what it means for them to miss the playoffs um some have higher stakes than others which is what we what we talked about um but yeah now we will get into our players to highlight segment um starting with the good for our uh friday september 22nd 2023 edition of how about that He's striking out less, walking more, and he's also making better contact. Turning into a strikeout machine just out of nowhere. He's been excellent all around this year. He is getting a... How about that? Yeah, so for my how about that, for the third time this year, I am going reliever diving. Nice. Uh, Making a splash today. I talked about Andrew Wance back in April. I talked about Josh Spores back in June. And on September 22nd, I'm talking about Abner Uribe from the Milwaukee Brewers. Uh, Chris, I don't know if you've heard of this guy. Have you heard of him? No. Oh, well, I'm glad you haven't because you're about to learn a lot about this guy. If you've never seen him pitch before, he is absolutely filthy. Uh, He has a 129 ERA and a 276 FIP in 28 innings pitch with the Brewers this season. Uh, And since his MLB debut on July 8th, yes, he debuted this year. He is one of only nine qualified relievers that hasn't given up a home run. Uh, He also has 10.97 strikeouts per nine in that time. So he's striking guys out and not giving up good contact. Also, since that day, he has a 23% sweet spot percent against. That is tied for the 12th lowest among the 383 pitchers with at least 50 batted balls against in that span. Again, a 23% sweet spot rate. That is very, very, very good. Um, like I mentioned, 12 out of 383. Uh, his most common pitch is his sinker, which he throws about 60% of the time. It averages 99.4 miles per hour and also 21 inches of drop. Uh, so since his debut on July 8th, he has thrown 50 sinkers that have reached 100 miles per hour and had more than 20 inches of drop, both of those things. He's done that 50 times. He's one of just nine pitchers that have done so even once in this span, but none of the other eight 
have thrown uh, more than 26 of such pitches, and he's thrown 50. So he's near double the second most in terms of sinkers with 100 miles per hour and 20 inches of drop, uh, which is crazy. His sinker has a whiff rate of 24.3%, which is tied with Josh Hader for the second highest whiff rate uh, on sinkers. Uh, Josh Hader, Brewers fans might remember for being uh, another dominant closer that they have or reliever because I don't think Abner Uribe is a closer. But uh, yeah, second highest whiff rate among these 67 pitchers with at least 100 swings against their sinker. Uh, And he's tied with Josh Hader there. Opponents are hitting 150 and slugging 167, excuse me, against his sinker with a seven degree average launch angle. Uh, So his sinker has been a dominant uh, primary pitch and even more dominant is his slider which is his secondary pitch he throws it 33 percent of the time he throws a slider 33 th- percent of the time but he throws it 40 percent of the time with two strikes in the count so uh he you know he throws it more with two strikes obviously his slider has 26 plate appearances ending on it chris do you want to guess how many batted balls it has 26 plate appearances ending on his slider how many batted balls um 13. Six. Wow. He has six batted balls against the slider on 26 plate appearances, 16 strikeouts on 26 plate appearances, which is nuts. Uh, His slider has a whiff rate of 59.6%, the second highest among the 188 pitchers with at least 50 swings against their slider. Uh, His slider also has an expected batting average of 028 and an expected slugging of 044. Uh, that expected batting average ranks the lowest, and his expected slugging ranks the third lowest among the <clears throat> 2,419 pitches with at least 10 plate appearances ending on them. Again, his slider is number one and ex- his number one in expected batting average, number three in expected slugging out of 2,419. So Abner Uribe has established himself as the filthiest, one of the filthiest relievers in the league. Uh, And between him and Devin Williams, that is one of the best back ends of the bullpen in baseball. So between the Brewers rotation and their bullpen, if their offense gets hot in October, they're a World Series contender. And it's because if, you know, if you're winning after, if they're winning after seven, they have Abner Uribe for the eighth. Yeah. Abner Uribe. Got to make sure I get the pronunciation right. How about that? Yeah. Abner (laughs) Just, just like him, just, just like just him. like Abner Doubleday. I remember, yeah, <laughs> I remember Abner Double Abner Doubleday only had a fifty eight percent whiff rate on his slider. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> he only he's... threw he only threw forty nine sinkers with a hundred miles per hour and twenty inches of drop. Yeah. Um. So yeah, uh, Abner Uribe, that's pretty pretty stellar, pretty good analysis there. Um, my how about that? is actually a victory lap, although he's probably Ooh. not going to be a hit overall for the season. <laughs> but uh, he's done really well over his last 13 games. And I'm talking about a guy in a team who has been, you know, that this team has been irrelevant for basically the entire year, but he's doing well over his last 13 games. I'm talking about Edward Olivares of the Kansas City Royals, I believe an outfielder for uh for Kansas City. In his last 13 games, he's hitting 372 with an 1158 OPS. And out of 165 qualifiers in this span, his average ranks sixth, on base percentage ranks 10th, slugging ranks fifth, and OPS ranks fourth. That 1158 OPS is the fourth best in baseball in his last 13 games. Uh, out of 245 hitters with 150 plus pitches seen in this span, Edward Olivares' expected batting average ranks 13th, expected slugging ranks 8th, and expected Woba ranks 9th. So his expected numbers, uh, you know, at least expected slugging and expected Woba are top 10 out of over 240 hitters. So those expected ranks are right up there with the actual uh, number ranks. Uh, Part of this has to do with him hitting the ball harder. Uh, Edward Olivares' average exit velocity has gone from 86.7 miles per hour before the span to 89.0 miles per hour in the span. Uh, and more notably, what has resulted in him getting more extra base hits has been the average exit velocity on fly balls, particular, particularly. Uh, his average exit velocity on fly balls has gone from 89.1 miles per hour to 98. 
6.6 miles per hour. That is a 9.5 mile per hour difference uh, on, you know, how hard he's hitting fly balls, which is pretty stellar. And per because of this, his barrel rate has gone from 7% before the span to 15% in the span. Uh, along with that, what's what I found very interesting, and it's very unusual to find this, uh, you know, in a span of more than 10 games, all nine of the fly balls that he, that Edward Olivares has hit have been 90 or have been 32 degrees or below. All nine of his fly balls he has hit have been 32 degrees of launch angle or below, which is significant because all of them are in the sweet spot zone. That sweet spot zone we've talked about. It's eight to 32 degrees. Hitters hit 590 and slug almost 1100 uh, when they when they keep it in that zone. So when Edward Olivares is hitting what's considered to be a fly ball, he's not hitting the ones that are hanging up and 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 stopping 50 feet short of the fence. That's mostly competitive fly balls that um, that are gonna either leave the ballpark or come close to it. So also, you know, with him keeping them keeping those fly balls 32 degrees or below Edward Olivares' sweet spot rate has gone from 33% before the span to 47% in the span. And out of 250 hitters with two, with 25 plus batted balls in the span, Edward Olivares' sweet spot rate ranks 10th, uh, which is, you know, top it's a, uh, yeah, top uh, two and a half percent there. And also his, or no, not two, top two and a half percent. It's like top 4%. Uh, his walk rate has gone from 5% to 10%. So we've seen the ball a little bit better. His chase rate has gone from 31% to 27%. And his chase rate with two strikes has gone from 45% to 33%. So putting together some competitive at-bats along with hitting the ball harder, hitting the ball harder on fly balls, uh, getting more barrels, and you know, also not popping, you know, not hitting the ball crazy in the air and and having non-competitive fly balls. So Edward Olivares is getting a how about that on a uh, on a little bit of a victory lap. Um although yes, he sir. hasn't had the quite the breakout that I would have wanted him to. Not that I necessarily expected him to be the the young royal to break out, but you know, he was he had a good year last year. All right, so now we will get into a a not a preview of the weekend ahead. We will get into our Go from the highs to the lows where we're talking players or subjects that have been underperforming with our uh, Friday, September 22nd, 2023 edition of Slightly Alarming Statistics. He's been barreling up the ball way less. He's not missing bats. He's not getting the ball on the ground and people are hitting it in the air more. It's been so bad. He is getting a slightly alarming. Yeah, so for my slightly alarming, I'm going with a guy that uh, was an all-star this season and is you know going to be playing games in the playoffs. It's Orlando Arcia from the Atlanta Braves. Uh, going back to September 6th, he is slashing just 172, 234, 259 for a 493 OPS and a 32 weighted runs created plus. So that weighted runs created plus ranks 11th lowest among the 172 qualifiers in this span. Uh, and he's been, you know, he's been swinging and missing a lot more he's hitting the ball not as hard uh before the span he had a strikeout rate of 18.5 percent and in the span it is up at 25 percent so that is a six and a half percent increase on his strikeouts and more specifically his chase rate has gone from 25 percent to 29 percent so that is a about four point uh increase in excuse me in chase rate uh, but most notably before the span his average exit velocity was 88.8 .8 miles per hour and in the span, it is down to just 83.8 miles per hour. So he's hitting the ball five miles per hour less. Uh, his sweet spot rate in the span is also 20.9%. That is the 12th lowest among the 220 hitters with at least 25 batted balls in the span. And lastly, during the span, his average exit velocity on fly balls specifically is 82.1 miles per hour. Uh, that is the lowest among the 99 hitters with at least 10 fly balls in the span. So Orlando Arcia, he's swinging and missing more. Uh, he's hitting a lot softer. And for that reason, he is my slightly alarming. Yeah, Orlando Arcia. Slightly alarming. Um, Yeah, unfortunate there. But luckily, the Braves are pretty secure at where they're at. So hopefully he fix it, fixes it up by playoff time at least for their sake. Uh, my slightly alarming stays in the same division. 
another with another team who's pretty comfortably in a playoff spot. Uh, I'm staying. I'm talking about the Phillies, and I'm talking about Michael Lorenzen, um, who we've probably referenced a little bit because of how rough the pitchers who were traded, the starting pitchers who were traded at the trade deadline, have been doing. And Michael Lorenzen is another example of that. And in Michael Lorenzen's last six appearances. He has a 9.23 ERA and 7.74 FIP in 26 and a third innings pitch. And I say six appearances because I think he's been taken out of the starting rotation. Uh, His last appearance was a relief appearance. He came out in the fifth inning. And unfortunately for him, in a third of an inning, gave up uh, three or four runs. I forget exactly which number it was, but did not have a great relief appearance Mm -hmm. and uh, out of 141 pitchers with 20 plus innings in the span, Lorenzen has the second worst ERA and second worst FIP Uh, out of 125 pitchers with 400 plus pitches thrown in the span. His expected batting average against is seventh highest expected slugging against is seventh highest and expected Woba against is eighth highest. Uh, Part of this has to do with him striking less batters out, Uh, His strikeout rate has gone from 19% before the span to 11% in the span. And out of 141 pitchers, his strikeout rate is fourth lowest in the span. And also he is walking more batters. His walk rate has gone from 6.7% to 10.9%, bringing his strikeout minus walk rate from 13% before the span to 0% in the span. He struck out as many batters as he's walked, which is not what you want as a pitcher. And out of 141 pitchers, his strikeout minus walk rate in this span is third lowest. Uh, Unfortunately, his chase rate has gone from 31% before the span to 26% in the span, likely, uh, you know, decreasing that strikeout number and increasing that walk number. Along with that, his home runs per nine has gone from 0.9 to 2.7 out of 141 pitchers in this span. His home runs per nine is the fourth highest in baseball. Uh, Part of this, part of just the general lack of success over the past few, um, over the past uh, month or so has been uh, pulled batted balls. His pulled batted ball rate has gone from 36% before the span to 45% in this span. And opposing batters are hitting 500 and slugging 1045 on pulled batted balls off Michael Lorenz and in this span. Uh, Along with that, his pulled barrel rate has gone from 3% before the span to 7% in this span. Uh, uh, You know, the average general barrel rate is around 7%, but his pulled barrel rate is at 7%. Uh, It is the 16th highest rate out of 167 pitchers with 50 plus batted balls in this span. Um, And opposing hitters are... Six for seven with five home runs on pulled barrels against Michael Lorenzen in, in this six game span. Uh, and looking at pitch specifics, uh, all four of his most used pitches have a 300 plus average against them and a 470 plus slugging against them. So nothing really to rely on pitch wise uh, over the over these last last six appearances. And you know, you, I mentioned Lorenzen because you know he was traded. He was you know, the Phillies got him for a reason. They wanted him to be, uh, you know, a potential middle slash back of the rotation piece to supplement guys like Nola and Wheeler uh, at the top of the rotation. Unfortunately, has been unable to do that since his no hitter. Um, I wonder if how many pitches he threw in that no hitter has a little something to do with this, but, you know, I, I wouldn't completely re- rely on that sentiment, but, you know, we're wondering if he's even going to be a, a, a reliable bullpen piece for the Phillies, never mind, you know, rotation piece. So I'm hoping, hoping for better, you know, especially considering uh, Brian came on the show, talked about a great interaction he had with him. Seems like an overall good guy. So hoping for the best, but uh, right now he is getting a slightly alarming. All right. So that should do it for the players to highlight. And now we will get into a preview of the week ahead so much or preview of the weekend ahead uh so much to watch i will be looking at the series to watch daniel will be looking at the day by day pitching matchups and uh as far as series to watch you know all anyone competing for a playoff spot right now uh should be kept an eye on but specifically Rays blue jays is an amazing series uh rays are fighting for for a division spot they are one and a half games back of the 
Orioles. They just won't get off of their backs. Uh, while the Blue Jays are, you know, we we talked about them a lot in this show. They're 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 hanging on to their playoff spot, hoping to get ahead in some way. But it's going to be a major challenge over at Tropicana Field. Along with that, we have Marlins Brewers uh, in Miami. Brewers uh, magic number is two, so they have almost clinched the NL Central. But the Marlins are fighting for that playoff spot. They are currently tied with the Cubs for. Yeah, I believe, yes, tied with the Cubs for the third wildcard spot. So all these remaining games are crucial to them. And the premier series to watch is uh, something we we prefaced in our last show. It is Rangers Mariners at Globe Life Field. And uh, and yeah, it's it's they're both 84 and 68, both competing for the AL West, both competing for the AL wildcard is going to be fun. Uh, can't wait to can't wait to watch it. What do you got for the day by day pitching matchups? Yeah, some potential playoff uh, previews in there, especially with Marlins Brewers. If you know if the Marlins make the playoffs, they will very likely be facing Milwaukee. So uh, yeah, today on Friday, Andrew Abbott goes for the Reds against the Pirates uh, in Cincinnati. Pirates looking to play spoiler for a division rival. That could be a big you know moral moral victory series for them. Uh, Chris Bassett and Tyler Glass now will face each other in Blue Jays and Rays. Um, Corbin Burns will face the uh, Marlins for the Brewers in Miami. JT Shajua will be opening for Miami. Um, Tyler Miguel and Taiwan Walker will face each other in Mets Phillies in Philadelphia. Charlie Morton will be facing the Nationals for the Braves in Washington. Um, you will have Shane Bieber. Is he coming off the IL? Is this his first start off the IL? Uh, he'll be pitching for the Guardians today against the Orioles in Cleveland. Um, the, I think Cleveland's going to be eliminated from the playoffs soon if they have if they're not already. Um, you will have Chris Sale facing his former team for the White Sox at Fenway tonight. Um, Bryce Miller and Dane Dunning will face each other in Rangers and Mariners, obviously in Texas. Pablo Lopez will be facing the Angels for the Twins in Minnesota. Sawyer Gibson Long will be facing. The A's for the Tigers. He struck out 11 in his last uh, start. And then Sean Manaya will be facing the Dodgers for the Giants in LA. And matchup of the night comes from Royals at Astros. It is Cole Reagans versus Framber Valdez. Ooh, yeah. Yeah, fun one. We, we stand both those guys. Yes, we do. Um, on Saturday, Kyle Wright will pitch for the Braves against the Nationals. It's a 105 start. Carlos Rodon will face the Diamondbacks for the Yankees. Sonny Gray will face the Angels for the Twins. Uh, Jordan Wicks will face the Rockies for the Cubs. Jose Quintana and Zach Wheeler will face each other in Mets Phillies. Uh, that one kicking off at Citizens Bank Park at uh, 405. Shunjin Ryu and Zach Littell will face each other in Blue Jays and Rays. Uh, Dylan Cease will be facing the Red Sox for the White Sox at Fenway. John Means will be facing the Guardians for the Orioles in Cleveland. Logan Gilbert will be facing the Rangers for the Mariners. The Rangers have yet to announce their starter. Um, Clayton Kershaw will be facing the Giants for the Dodgers. And matchup of the night comes from, or excuse me, matchup of the afternoon comes from Brewers Marlins. It's Brandon Woodruff versus uh, Jesus Lazardo. Yeah, that is just solid overall matchup there. The all right. So then on Sunday, finishing out the weekend, a busy, fun, exciting weekend in baseball. Christopher Sanchez will be facing the uh Mets for the Phillies uh to finish off that series. Yusei Kikuchi and Taj Bradley will face each other in Blue Jays and Rays. Spencer Strider will face the Nationals for the Braves. Um, you will have um Hunter Brown facing the Royals for the Astros. Joe Ryan facing the Angels for the Twins. Um, Brian Wu facing the Mariners for the Rangers. The Rangers for the Mariners. Rangers have yet to announce their starter once again. <coughs> Eduardo Rodriguez will be facing the um, A's for the Tigers. Uh, that is in Oakland. By the way, did you see that uh, the A's got Miguel Cabrera just like an eighty dollar bottle of wine for his retirement. I I saw well I saw um baseball images that precede unfortunate events tweeted out there was a guy there was a screenshot of a guy who predicted it perfectly yeah although yeah I mean 
I guess it's almost better from an A's like player's perspective or like some like some employee's perspective where like if they went all out for for Miguel Cabrera and not one of their own like and not their own players or their own employees, then maybe that would be a, a worse look. But uh, but yeah, it does. It does just look bad for PR there. Fair enough, but I don't know if anyone remembers this, but uh, there was an article before the 2010 season that talked about how Miguel Cabrera like was was becoming sober and that he had like had drinking problems previously. Oh, uh, yeah, I did yeah. not know that. I think a lot of people didn't. It was 13 years ago, and I'm sure that, you know, maybe he does it casually now. It's, you know, it's a long time to, you know, whatever. But yeah, that's not a fantastic look either. Yeah, yeah. Like, imagine if, like, CC Sabathia did a retirement tour and the Red Sox got him, like, a bottle of wine. Right, yeah. Like, that, that's not a great look. No, no, it's not. <laughs> yeah, anyway, there's that. But uh, continuing on with Sunday, uh, Savant, uh, Michael Walker will be pitching for the Padres against the Cardinals. Lance Lynn will be pitching on the last Sunday Night Baseball of the year against the Giants. And matchup of the day, once again, comes from Brewers Marlins. It is Freddie Peralta versus Edward Cabrera. Uh, it is a must-win series for the Marlins against the playoff team, and they get the three best starters in that rotation, which is brutal. Yeah, not the best. Not the best. Um, although Sandy Alcantara is making a rehab start today, so that's big. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, that would be... If they could get him for, like, game 161 or 162, that would be pretty cool. Um. Yeah, that shall do it for this installment of the Buffer Place Radio. We hope you enjoyed this one. If you are listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify and want to watch the conversation as it happens, go to the YouTube channel, subscribe to the YouTube channel. It is called Above Replacement Radio. Check out all the features, all the shorts, all the playlists, like guest interviews, most recently with Chris Cotillo of Mass Live, Red Sox Beat Reporter, talked about the High and Bloom era and everything, and even before that as he's been a beat writer for six years also check out the baseball history series which is timeless um you know it'll it'll always be fairly relevant although i guess uh albert pujols's career isn't uh fully updated yeah, right, because we did right. it we did it pre-2020 so if you're if you're watching episode, the albert pujols episode and you want to see his 700th home run i'm sorry but it yeah. happened about two and a half years later in in arr's version of history he's he's around 650 uh i think yeah i think he's around there um but yeah other than that it is all completely timeless so check out the baseball history series also check out our social medias i am at chris underscore gianta on twitter daniel is at daniel underscore current on both twitter and instagram uh and also uh yeah i think that yeah that's all that's all i all i have to mention uh, yeah. We hope you enjoy this one, and we hope to see you next time where we will be talking all the happenings in Major League Baseball once again. See you then. This conversation. This conversation is over. Is over. <laughs>